И мы не стыдимся показывать себя такими, какими мы есть. Россия несет ответственность за судьбу этих людей. Вы не считаете, что Нет, этот слушайте, смертный слушайте, приговор... Меня глаза Запада не интересуют вообще. А вы считаете, что там независимый суд? Да. Я убежден, что там независимый суд. А вы считаете, у вас независимый суд? А вообще по, по поводу отношений с Великобританией сейчас, да? Они, ну, сказать, что они плохие, это, конечно, мягко сказано. Да, да? вы знаете, по-моему, как... там уже нет никакого поля для маневра в этих отношениях. А как вы... Потому что и Джонсон, и Трасс заявляют публично, мы должны победить Россию, мы должны поставить Россию на колени. Ну, давайте, ставьте. А как вы... Потому что и Джонсон, и Трасс заявляют публично, мы должны победить Россию, мы должны поставить Россию на колени. Ну, давайте, ставьте. Good morning from Athens, Greece. It is 8 o'clock here on this Friday morning. Let's get to some news. We are going to talk about Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister. We'll talk about the trip from various EU leaders to Kiev to meet with Elensky. We'll talk about Gazprom and we'll do a clown world. Oh, we'll also talk about the, uh, the American military, foreign fighters, mercenaries that have allegedly been caught in, uh, in Kharkov, in the Kharkov region, I believe is where they, they allegedly grabbed them. So let's first start with Lavrov. And let's talk about Sergei Lavrov and his comments. Let's also touch upon the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum and uh, how that is going, because that is taking place this, uh, these past couple of days and this weekend. And I believe that Vladimir Putin is going to be speaking at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum on Saturday, I think, either Saturday or Sunday. And that's going to be the, the keynote address. But first, let's get to Lavrov, because Lavrov has been on fire the last uh, day or two. So the first interview that he gave, which I found to be fascinating, is the interview with BBC, with um, the journalist Steve Rosen, Rosenberg, I believe. And he's, he's kind of been the BBC's guy in, uh, in Russia for a while now. He, he speaks fluent Russian. And uh, Lavrov likes to give interviews to uh, to Mr. Steve, <laughs> because uh, I think uh, Rosenberg, uh, this guy challenges him, and I think Lavrov likes to be challenged. You'll never hear an interview like this coming from the from the collective West mainstream media to to collective West leaders. You'll never hear these kinds of, of challenging questions being thrown at like Biden or uh, or Macron or someone like that. Won't happen. But uh, Lavrov likes to take these questions, he likes to field them, and he likes to give answers, and boy, do you get some good answers from Lavrov uh, when he does these interviews with the BBC. Notice how the Russians, the, uh, the Russian Federation, outside of Canada, the CBC, the uh, state media of, uh, of Trudeau, the uh, Russian Federation, I don't believe they've really kicked out any news organizations or banned any uh, collective West news organizations, unlike what the collective West has done to Russian media. As you can see, the BBC is still there. They still have reporters going to, uh, to events and they're still giving interviews with, uh, with Russian uh, officials. So that's something to note. But um, this interview from, so go up this way. This interview was, was pretty amazing because I think I got two really good sound bites from it. The first really interesting sound bite is the one that's really making all the rounds and that's where uh, the BBC reporter asks Lavrov about, he comes out with the line, in the eyes of the West, in the eyes of the West and Lavrov is like, you know, we don't care about you know, what the West think. We're not concerned about the eyes of the, uh, of the West. And I thought that was uh, an incredible line. And um, the next line that I thought Lavrov, that, that really caught my attention, I thought Lavrov made a very interesting statement, was, um, was where he was asked about the, the British mercenaries and uh, it was that line of questioning. And uh, they started to talk about the UK and how the UK views Russia. And Lavrov was like, 
Well, actually, here's his quote. He says, I don't think there's even room for, for maneuver anymore, referencing uh, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. And Lavrov said that because both Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Liz Truss say openly that we should defeat Russia, we should force Russia to its knees. Go on then, do it. I thought that was, I mean, you look at like Lavrov's face when he says, go on, do it. I mean, you can tell that he's not playing around. Russia is not playing around. And uh, I think it's interesting how Lavrov references, he doesn't really reference um, the UK people. He, he's specific, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, because the question that was thrown at him was about you know, the UK and how the UK views Russia and, and this line of questioning. And Lavrov brings it right back around to Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. And he's like, you know what? If Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, if they want to, uh, if they want to bring us to our knees, go for it, do it. That was a pretty, pretty bold statement from Lavrov. The next, um, the next interview that Lavrov gave was to a Russian journalist. <laughs> and, uh, this was kind of a joke. This is kind of tongue in cheek because the Russian journalist, she was asking Lavrov about Ukraine's membership into the EU. And uh, she was kind of getting a little, uh, I don't want to say confused, but she was kind of losing track of uh, the membership process. And Ukraine goes into the EU and it becomes a member or it becomes a candidate country and all of this stuff. And uh, Lavrov was joking around and he's like, <laughs> he tells the reporter, yeah, Ukraine will be a member to the, to the membership. <laughs> and that's kind of a joke in, uh, in Russian. It's also in Greek, by the way. We have the same kind of uh, joke where the word member can mean member to be part of something, but it also means like member, as in, you know, the thing that, that men have. <laughs> member. So uh, Lavrov is pretty much saying that, uh, joking around with the reporter, he's saying that Ukraine can be, you know, a member to the EU, can be that thing that men have to the, uh, to the EU. So that was, uh, that was a funny exchange in that you got to see Lavrov is pretty, uh, <laughs> he's, he's sharp. He is really, really sharp. So anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about the uh, St. Petersburg International Forum because that's the big event, event that is taking place in Russia right now in St. Petersburg. And uh, the mainstream media is working overtime to make it seem like the St. Petersburg International Forum is, uh, is a failure. Where uh, the truth of the matter is, is that the SPIEF is a huge success. And uh, it's important to... Uh, to talk about the SPIEF, the St. Petersburg International Forum, because what it showcases is that you have hundreds of companies, um, many, many world leaders who are willing to attend this event in Russia and who are ready to do business with the Russians. And it shows that Russia is not so isolated as the collective West would like everyone in the world to think. And that is why the collective West is working overtime to say that this is a failure, that this is a dud, Putin's, um, what did we, what did we talk about yesterday in the live stream with uh, I Earl Grey on the Duran, that the Daily Beast said something like Putin's money, money grab or money showcase is a dud. So they're, you know, they're working overtime to make it seem like the, uh, the St. Petersburg Forum is, is, is being shunned by the international community because they can't admit the truth, which is that outside of Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the rest of the world, Africa, Latin America, Asia, they're ready to do business with Russia. And they're actually going to St. Petersburg to do business with Russia. Here are some numbers. 1,244 Russian companies are attending, 256 foreign firms are attending, and uh, 4,188 4, journalists from 30 countries have also registered. So it's, it sounds like a success to me. But 
the uh, the collective West media will never will never paint it as a success because that'll destroy the narrative that Russia is isolated. It sounds to me that like the uh, it's more like the collective West that is isolated and not Russia. But Putin will be speaking, I think, on Saturday or Sunday. Let me see if I have that information here. The president will be sharing his assessment on, uh, on multipolar economic models and the opportunity and prospects it presents for the entire global market. And he will be giving that uh, address from the forum on Friday. Today, Russian President Vladimir Putin will address the forum on Friday and give his assessment of the global political situation and the economy. Much of his speech will be devoted to stimulating business activity and strengthening Russian's foreign trade and investment ties. Yeah. Okay, so today, I was wrong. Not Saturday, not Sunday. Today, this afternoon, we will probably hear Vladimir Putin speak, and that is the, uh, that is the main event. Now, let's shift gears and talk about Ukraine and uh, Kiev and the trip by Draghi, Johannes, uh, Macron and Schultz to uh, to meet with Elensky and uh, they gave a press conference um, after the meeting and this was not confirmed Bloomberg actually broke the story and this was not confirmed because it was going to be a, a special secret surprise that these leaders were going to travel to Kiev actually Macron Draghi and um, Schultz the uh, German Chancellor they traveled together and the Romanian uh, leader traveled by himself separately to, uh, to Kiev. And they made statements during a press conference after meeting with Zelensky that uh, they support uh, Ukraine's candidacy into the European Union. Macron was against the candidacy at the beginning, but now he is uh, coming out in support of the, uh, of the candidacy for Ukraine. Uh, Schultz said that uh, Germany is in support of Ukraine's EU candidacy and that uh, Germany is going to provide all the support they can, including weapons. By the way, Germany is sending fewer rocket launchers to Ukraine this time around than they did previously. Germany will provide Ukraine with three multiple launch rocket systems in the coming months, according to the defense minister. And uh, the figure is down from four due to lack of munitions, according to Business Insider. So Germany went from four rocket launchers to now three that are being sent to Ukraine because of lack of munitions. In other words, demilitarization of Germany, not demilitarization of Ukraine only, but of Germany as well. Anyway, let's get back to the meeting with Zelensky. So they gave a press conference. They said that uh, they support Ukraine's EU candidacy. No, uh, no big deal. The candidacy for Ukraine is uh, to get it to the EU is going to take something like 20, 20 years, if that. Let's walk through the, the market here. So they're preparing the, the outdoor market today here in this neighborhood in Athens. And so, you know, this is this is not so much about getting Ukraine into the European Union. What this is really about is is giving Ukraine some sort of uh, lifeline. And what do I mean by that? Here's what I think is going on. And this is just my hunch, but uh, this is what I think is is happening. I think that the U.S. and the Biden White House, they're ready to ditch Ukraine. They're ready to cut Alensky loose. They're ready to possibly even throw Alensky under the bus in a big, big way. And I think the EU leaders understand this. They've probably even been told this. And I bet you that Macron, Schultz, Johannes, and Draghi, understanding that the U.S. is about to turn Alensky from a hero to a zero, and knowing that the EU is on the hook in a big, big way with regards to Ukraine. In other words, the U.S. Wow. Those are some nice fish. Kalimera. Kalimera. No. Hola, Afta. Bravo. Bravo. 
Um, what was I saying? Um, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, so uh, Draghi, Macron, Johannes, and Schultz, they understand that uh, the U.S., they can cut Ukraine loose. And for the most part, the U.S. is far away. The media will cover up for uh, Bidenopolis and, you know, they'll move on to like the next news cycle, the next news item. But Ukraine, well, Ukraine and Alensky, well, they're smacking in Europe, right? And the EU is on the hook. Ursula van der Leyen has, uh, has actually committed to the European Union flipping the bill for, uh, for reconstructing Ukraine. So the EU is, is stuck. They are on the hook for Ukraine. They can't ditch it. It's, uh, it's right in the middle of, uh, of Europe. It's got all of these weapons that have flooded into the country. It's bordering Poland. <laughs> you got Hungary. You got all of this, this commitment to Ukraine from a geographic, economic, political level. The EU simply can't walk away. Not to mention it's going to be a huge embarrassment for uh, European Union leaders. And so this is what I think is happening. I think that Schultz and uh, his crew, Macron and these guys, they went to, uh, to, Ukraine, to Ukraine to do two things. One is to uh, probably reassure Elensky that the U.S. isn't going to, uh, to ax him, to kind of maybe calm him down and say, look, Elensky, we're here for you. We'll try to talk to Washington and uh, we'll try to make sure that you're okay. Don't worry, we're still committed to you. We'll still keep you propped up. And uh, even though Biden is, the Biden White House is, is running cold with you, you know, we still got your back. So I think that was the one reason they went there. And the other reason they went there is to, uh, to panic and give their support for EU candidacy in order to kind of give Elensky some leverage, not for Russia, but for the Biden White House. Not for Russia, but for the Biden White House. And... Uh, Macron didn't want to give the EU candidacy to the uh, European Union, uh, nor did Schultz for that matter, but I think they had no choice. I think they see the writing on the wall. They see that the US is ready to, uh, to ditch Alensky. And they said, you know what? We got to give Alensky some, some leverage. And uh, what did you guys think of the market, by the way? It's a nice outdoor market. Um, good prices, fresh food. Really, really nice. Uh, very, very strange that they're doing it on a Friday. Usually they do these markets on a Sunday. But um, anyway, I saw it as I was walking and I thought I would take, take everyone through it so they could see. It's a smaller market. Sometimes they have much, much bigger ones. But um, yeah, I think this is leverage for Alensky with regards to, uh, to the Biden White House, this EU candidacy. It's not about uh, Russia. And you heard Lavrov even laughing about it with the interview with the Russian journalist. He's like a member to the membership because he's like, Alensky is, is about to be cut loose by Washington and uh, the EU is starting to, to freak out and they're trying to find ways to one, reassure Alensky and two, to give Alensky some sort of uh, leverage so that uh, the Biden White House does hit, doesn't cut him loose and perhaps even turn him into, uh, from a hero to an enemy right to a despot because the u.s kind of does that with uh these leaders that they at one time support and then you know a month or two down the line they get tired of them and they turn them into uh into evil doers so <laughs> that's why i think the eu guys went there i don't think it has anything to do with uh getting Alensky to the negotiating table i don't think it has anything to do with uh with any of that stuff, to be quite honest. At first I thought, okay, maybe they're looking for an off-ramp. Um, in my report yesterday, I said that they're panicking and they want to find some sort of negotiation or some sort of solution. I've changed my mind. I've amended that, uh, that belief. And I actually now believe that it was done to, uh, to go there and save the, the EU's hide. The EU is invested in Ukraine in a big, big way. The U.S., everyone knows that Biden, the Biden White House can ditch them tomorrow. And CNN, MSNBC, they'll find something else to, uh, to talk about. But Europe, 
Europe is going to be screwed if uh, if Alensky is is cut off by the Biden White House. So they had to go there and reassure him and to uh, and to give him some sort of some sort of carrot, some sort of bone. Now we're going to be an EU candidate country. You see, um, the U.S. can't can't cut me loose now because I'm going to be part of the EU family. It, it reminds me of the movie Goodfellas. And I don't know if uh, if you remember the movie Goodfellas where Robert De Niro's character, he turned on that um, on that other character that was selling the all right, I can cross now that was selling like the hair pieces and and stuff like that. I don't know if you remember that character. I think um, I think it was Jimmy Jimmy Connolly was Robert De Niro's character. and The other guy was Maury something anyway. For some reason, like De Niro's character thought that the uh, that that Maury guy was like skimming off the top and cheating him, and uh, that's it. He was going to he was going to take him out, right? Uh, he was going to whack him, and uh, you had Ray Liotta's character. Um, he was like you know running interference, trying to assure the that Maury guy, the guy that sells the wigs, that look look, I'll speak with. Uh, with Robert De Niro's character, it's Jimmy, I think it was his name. I'll speak with Jimmy and don't worry, you're not gonna get whacked. You're gonna be okay, uh, I'll take care of it. And he was trying to calm down the situation. I, I think you got the same exact scenario going on in Kiev right now. I think the US is ready to say Yelensky's out and the EU is saying, oh crap, we better uh, figure out ways to, uh, to keep Yelensky in and to keep this going because we're on the hook. And then, of course, the EU would like to get to the negotiating table sometime, say, in, in August, September to, to tie this all up and, and be done with it. But for now, they're, they're running uh, damage control. Anyway, enough rambling about that story. Let's, uh, let's talk about Gazprom. We'll talk about the Russian, the American mercenaries, foreign fighters. Oh, by the way, the UK also sanctioned uh, Russian patriarch Kirill. So the EU didn't sanction Kirill, thanks to Hungary and Viktor Orban, but the UK decided to sanction the Russian patriarch. And uh, what a despicable act from uh, the Boris Johnson government and from Liz Truss. Now that they've sanctioned Kirill, I will, I will say with 100% certainty that the Boris Johnson government will fall and will collapse. Now I can say that with absolute certainty. Um, they've, they've crossed the red line and Boris Johnson and Liz Truss are going to pay a very, very heavy price for doing what they have done. That's just my hunch on it. Um, they've, they've taken this way too far. But, you know, as Lavrov said in his, uh, in his interview with the Russian journalist, you want to bring us to our knees? Go for it. You know, do it. So um, let's discuss Gazprom real quick. And I've got an update there with regards to these, uh, this equipment, these, uh, these pumps that have been sent to Canada and then the Canadian government from Siemens, they were sent to Canada for repairs. And then the Canadian government said, well, we can't send them to Russia because of sanctions. And now we have 40% less gas being sent to Germany and Germany is freaking out. Habeck, the, uh, the deputy vice chancellor, green energy, I don't know, ecological or technology, whatever he is, minister. He has like three, four titles, the guy, and he's underqualified for all of those titles. But uh, anyway, he came out with a statement blaming Russia and, and saying that this is a political decision and all of these things. And, you know, Russia's evil. And, uh, and, Russia's like, you know, look, we sent the equipment, Siemens hat was, was going to give us the equipment, everything was going to be fine, Siemens sent it to Canada, and the Canadians stopped the equipment from being repaired and sent back. And so the Russian authorities they actually came out with a statement and they said, you know what you need to do, Germany and Habeck? you need to call up Canada and you need to figure this out. <laughs> That's simple. That's what the Russians said. 
And uh, I, I don't think this was a political decision at all because why would the Russians box themselves in like that? Because if, uh, if Germany or Canada wanted to call Russia's bluff, all they would have to do is repair, those, uh, repair that equipment and send it to Russia and see if the Russians get the gas flowing again. That's how you would be able to call their bluff. It's so easy to call Russia's bluff on this story that I don't think the Russians would be dumb enough to box themselves in like that at all. I, I think the Russians are like, look, Siemens gonna, is going to provide us with this. Okay, send it over. Siemens doesn't send it over. The Russians say, well, for technical reasons, for safety and technical reasons, we can't, you know, get all the, uh, all the gas to Germany, period. And we're waiting. We're waiting for this equipment to be sent back to us. And um, they said to, uh, to Germany, call up Trudeau, call up Canada and figure it out. And sure enough, what is happening now? Germany is now in diplomatic talks with Canada in order to get this equipment sent to the Russians. That freaking simple. We have got children in the collective West leading us. Absolute children. But, um, you know, even if it was a political decision, Russia is definitely well within their rights at this moment in time, given all the sanctions that have been placed on Russia, to, uh, to make these little political ploys, these uh, political uh, maneuvers to, to squeeze Germany if they wanted to. They're well within their rights, given all the sanctions that, uh, that the West has placed on Russia and the, the fact that the West is fighting uh, a war with Russia, a proxy war using Ukraine to, to fight with the Russians. So the Russians are well within their right to do that if they wanted to. But I don't think this is what, what, what this was about because it's too easy to call Russia's bluff. It's just way too easy. And so the Russians are not, uh, they're not gonna let themselves get boxed in like that. And so I think this was absolutely 100% a problem with, these, uh, with this equipment. And um, the Russians said, we're waiting for it. And this is between Germany and Canada. And sure enough, you see Germany and Canada now um, in dialogue to try and figure this out. I don't understand what they need to talk about, to be quite honest. I don't understand this. We're in diplomatic dialogue right now to figure this out. Schultz should just call Trudeau and say, look, we need this equipment in order to get the gas flowing. And Trudeau should say, yeah, no problem. Here it is. It's, it, it, this should be like a two minute phone call, if that. If we had adults in the room, but we don't have adults. We have uh, Justin, the child, Trudeau and we have Olaf the buffoon Schultz and so they can't figure it out it's it's crazy and you have Habeck who's like I said the, the German I don't know bio, environment technology vice chancellor minister and uh like I said he's got like five titles to him and he's underqualified for every one of those titles but um that's the latest with Gazprom the Russians said look if this continues you may have a hundred percent of the gas that uh, that won't be able to go to Germany because we need this equipment repaired. And so I think that was the, the straw that broke the camel's back for, for Schultz and actually got him on the telephone to Canada. I think that's when Schultz said, OK, I better call uh, Justin and and get him to send these pumps to uh, to Russia. And so, you know, Nord Stream 2 would have been handy right about uh, this time for Germany. If they had Nord Stream 2, everything would be okay. But uh, nope, they decided to cancel that as well. And so let's talk about the American mercenaries real quick, and we'll get to a really, really good clown world. So um, the Russians, well, not, not even the Russians, I don't think. I, actually, I think it's the, the, uh, the Donbass that is saying that they have captured... Um, two American mercenaries, American fighters in Ukraine, in Kharkov. Now, we've seen photos of these guys, the before photos, and we've now seen some after photos of them captured. I, I can't confirm if, if these photos are real or not. Um, I can't confirm if they're captured or not. The U.S. Uh, State Department, they have actually come out with a statement and they said, if if this is real, if, it, if this is in fact true, then we will do everything in our power to secure their release. 
But right now, even the State Department said they can't confirm this. And um, that is where we are at this moment in time. So we have photos of the, uh, of the two American um, fighters before, like before they went to, uh, to Ukraine. And we have photos allegedly of them being held uh, hostage, being captured. So we have photos of them actually captured. And uh, that's where we are. And we have the US State Department saying, if this is real, if this is indeed fact, then we're going to, uh, to do what we can to secure their release. That is where we are with this situation. Is it embarrassing for the United States? Yeah, it is, but I don't think there was any secret that uh, American mercenaries or foreign fighters were in Ukraine. And the State Department also, once again, as it was talking about this story, they once again urged Americans to not go to Ukraine, to not go to Ukraine and fight. So that was a statement from the U.S. State Department. Let's do a clown world and we'll wrap this video up. And this clown world has to do, once again, with the letter Z. And this is from Japan and a Japanese airline company, actually a subsidiary, I believe, of uh, JAL, the, the main Japanese airline called Zip Air. I believe they are a subsidiary. I'm not, don't, don't quote me on that, but that's what I read. Anyway, this company is like one of these like domestic or, or short distance you know, new, low cost, no frills, airlines, whatever, Zip Air, one of these uh, carriers. They have a giant Z, and you're gonna see a photo right now. A giant Z on the, uh, on the airplane, on the tail of the airplane. And um, it's not a very creative <laughs> logo, to be quite honest. It's just, you know, it looks like a Times New Roman font Z on the back of their plane. But obviously the company's called Zip Air, and so they have the Z painted there. Well, they've come out with a statement and they have said that they are now going to remove that Z from their planes. And it's gonna happen actually really, really quick. The company said that the pro-war symbol often seen, as, uh, often seen on Russian military vehicles will be removed in order to avoid any misunderstandings. That is what the company said from a statement out of, uh, out of Tokyo. And so, <laughs> you know, just cancel the Z, just cancel Z altogether. <laughs> just get rid of it. There's no need, we don't need Z anymore. How many, how many words have Z actually? <laughs> you don't need this. <laughs> you don't need that letter <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I have to admit, it's not exactly the most artistic or colorful uh, logo that uh, I've seen on uh, painted on an airplane, but it is what it is. The company's called Zip Air. You know, you got to uh, you got to highlight that Z. I guess that's their whole that's their whole branding is that letter Z. Zip Zip Air. You can't call them Ip Air. That would be kind of weird. <laughs> hey everybody, let's book a ticket on Ip Air. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna leave it there, everybody. That is the clown world, another cancel is, cancel, cancellation of, uh, of Z, this time coming from Japan. I will leave it there and uh, check out Alexander's um, videos. Check out the Duran's videos and go to the Duran.locals.com. Take care.